Any questions? I'm, I'm going to check online if there are questions too. Uh, but if you have questions, that'd be great. Anybody? This is a With all the ways that taxes don't work and whatnot, is there an ideal way, whether, regardless of whether or not it could ever happen, is there an ideal way where we can have services that everybody participates in, but without the wastefulness of the government? Well, I mean, I think the, the, the simple answer is that, that yes, there is. I mean, if, if this is what you're asking, I mean, there is an alternative. Um, and the thing is, basically, all the, the services that uh, government provides can be better provided uh, in the market. And in fact, most of them already have long historical precedents of, of being provided in the market. So, I mean, if, if, that's, uh, if that's what you meant, um, then, then yes, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's entirely possible. Um, and they would be... Uh, be much less uh, less wasteful and more efficient ways of providing the same things. And uh, it's not just the market. I mean, there, it's it's there's a market society, but it's also civil society, family society. That um, just because there are public goods doesn't mean there can't be privately provided public goods. And and so some things that for which there a profit motive wouldn't actually come out of that then the the civic-minded, a charitable motive would uh, would come into come into being, and so so basically, it's the the alternative is to say that oh well you know charity only works if it's if it's nationalized. We have to nationalize charity. Could you compare that to say a credit union versus a bank to make an analogy there, where the credit union is actually owned by the members. So it's a collective and they provide the same services, but it's not like the government in the sense of you know, taking it. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think you can use um, exactly those kind of analogies because um, kind of building on what Danny was saying, um, the, I mean, we, we talk a lot about the market and the market is, of course, very important. Profit and loss are very important. Um, but these arrangements for, for getting around these public these problems of providing public goods, um, they're they're much wider than just you know the, the profit motive. And so yes, you have all kinds of arrangements like this, um, like uh, things like like credit unions or uh, cooperatives, collectives, and all kinds of, of alternatives to um, strict profit and loss uh, that come up to to solve these problems. Um, and the reason that they're um, that they're sort of unobjectionable is because they're just the result of people getting together and deciding um, that that's the way they'd like to organize, you know, the production of whatever this good is. Um, and, and so, like, the, the big point um, is that it's, uh, despite the fact, of course, that we do talk about the market a lot, it's really the big distinction is between government and private individuals and the use of force and social cooperation, those are the, the big things. And it just happens to be that the market is one very important mechanism for, for social cooperation. Um, but yeah, you have all these other arrangements too that people come up with um, to try and solve these problems. So. What level of government would be acceptable? I mean, we, we, we have to have some form of government. If you just did away with everything, um, what, what's, the, uh, what's to keep complete anarchy from... from Right, complete total chaos. Well, one thing is that you have to distinguish between anarchy and anomi. Uh, anomi, an anome means laws. So arc means rulers. So just because you don't have rulers doesn't mean you, you don't have rules. Um, and there, yeah. Oh, no, 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 no sorry. No, just... Go ahead. Well, I, th I think what, you were, what you're trying to say is that um, there's, there's not necessary. We don't necessarily need um, government in the sense that's conventionally understood. We need rules. We need law. We need a society. Um, but it's not necessarily the case. I think we would argue um, that you need uh, government in the sense of somebody who forces you uh, 
to abide by laws that you did not, in fact, have a, a real role in setting up and then you never agreed to. Um, so, I mean, we do think that a lot of these fundamental services that government is supposed to provide uh, in terms of just uh, ensuring the very stability of society, those can be provided by private individuals um, who don't need to, to force each other at gunpoint to, to follow each other's will. Um, we, we do, uh, that's something that, uh, that I think that, that we would agree on. And there's a, also a distinction between government and governance. So, um, so we, we do need governance. We need um, security, we, um, enforcement of, of laws, uh, ju uh, judicial services, um, protection from, from foreign invasion. Um, these are things that, that are important, but they're all things that have at some point been provided by private individuals. Every single one of these services has been provided uh, by, by private services. In, in Ireland, for a thousand years, they were provided, they were all provided. Um, and and, he, and in, in most other societies, at least some of them have been provided in different, uh, different uh, ways. No. And just as, just as a practical matter, um, a solution that was proposed um, uh, by uh, Joseph Sobert, who's a, a great uh, libertarian writer, um, he, he just put it like this. He said, you look, as a practical problem, um, what we should basically do is just start stripping government away. And if we ever get to some point where uh, the social fabric is threatened, if we cut any more government, then we'll stop there. And if we don't reach that point, well then we'll just get rid of it at all. So. Could you have a workable system that's more localized? In other words, is part of our problem today in our United States um, government, the fact that so much of what we do is, is under the umbrella of the uh, national government at a federal level. If, if we were to, as a, as a practical matter, if we were to be able to take away some of the functions of the federal government and put them more in the hands of state and local governments, would that be more a move toward that kind of uh, cooperative society? I would certainly think so. I mean, I, decentralizing and, and localizing is, is a very big key to this because, of course, uh, you're much more likely to be able to have a productive conversation about governance with the people who live in the same community as you than, you know, the bigwigs in Washington, D.C. I mean, I think that's, uh, people understand that, and, and that's definitely true, that decentralizing power is a very important part of this, this process of uh, increasing liberty. And, and that can be another process uh, along the lines of what he was talking about before of just taking, taking off la layers of government until, until you find the, the stopping point that works. Well, you can also secede until you find the stopping point that works. Um, the, you, could, you can have states seceding from, from the federal government. You can have cities seceding from states. You can have um, neighborhoods seceding from cities. And ultimately, if, 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 it, if it's possible and if it works, then you can have the individual seceding politically from that little micro state, uh, which, which is not to say that you're seceding economically. It's important to, to realize that we're not talking about uh, economic atomism, um, that you still have the division of labor, that, that just because we're, we're not you know, part of the same state as Canada doesn't mean that, that we can't you know, buy and sell from Canada and that we're not part of the same civilization and part of the same society as Canada. And just like the Italian city-states, just because they're not part of, they weren't, at one point, part of one big Italian superstate didn't mean that they weren't a, a civilization that, that um, bought and sold from each other. It is a great point, is that you have these two effects, because as you become more decentralized, politically speaking, at the same time, there's this great effect where you become more integrated economically. Um, so even, um, even more decentralized type forms of government uh, results in... Uh, much more you know, global communication and economic activity and so on. Um, so it's an interesting effect that, uh, that goes the other way, but that's an entirely good thing. Mm -hmm. um, so th there is a question from the online audience. Um, Harold asks, which type of tax do you consider to be most destructive to society? Sales tax, personal income tax, or corporate tax? 
And what do you consider to be the most destructive aspect of that tax? Which tax do you consider to be most immoral as opposed to destructive? Thanks for the session. Thanks. Want to take that? No. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, as always, it sort of depends on, um, on where you start from uh, and exactly how you look at it. Uh, in general, um, you might say that uh, corporate income taxes can be among the most destructive um, because if, it's, if, um, if you're taxing, say, entrepreneurs who are supposed to be the driving force of the economy, um, if, they, you know, if, if they're prevented by, through taxes from doing this, from playing this very important role, um, that's obviously going to have very serious implications uh, for the whole economy. It's going to prevent us from being productive and growing and things like that. That's going to in turn gonna have a huge impact on standards of living. Um, so that, that may, might be one way to look at it. Um, Mur Murray Rothbard said that too much focus is given to the type of taxation and not enough to the level of taxation. That it's the level of taxation that, that matters the most. And so the, actually the most important part about the type of taxation is how it contributes to the level of taxation. So that's why Joe was talking about how a poll tax it, uh, or, or a head tax, just people, people talk about flat tax as being like everyone pays the same percentage. No, a real flat tax would be everybody paying the same amount. And, and that that, by its very nature, would limit taxation because you can't charge, like Joe was saying, that, that you can't charge too much of a tax because the poor have to be able to afford it. So it forces you to have a very limited, uh, a very low tax. And so Murray Rothbard wrote an article about, about Margaret Thatcher because she tried to um, institute a poll tax. And he said, but she missed the whole point of the poll tax because she instituted it, but, but then she tried to make it really high. And that's missing the whole point of the po poll tax is that it's supposed to force you to make it low. Oh, and, just, and then just to add also, because you asked about the, the morality of taxes too, a lot of people have made fairly convincing cases that things like personal income taxes are the most uh, onerous sort of taxes from the moral perspective as well, um, because they're, they're basically uh, punishing you for being productive, uh, among other things. Um, but again, I mean, this, I don't think there's a clear-cut answer to, uh, to either of those. It, it just it depends on a lot. Of, it really depends on what you're looking at. And in general, internal, internal taxes in, um, in general, including income taxes, but also including uh, excise taxes, that those are particularly hated, especially in the Anglo-American tradition, because of the invasion of privacy that they entail. So, so that's part of the reason why the Americans were... Uh, were so hated so much when the British switched from from tariffs to uh, to um, to excise and um, and, pers and direct taxation, uh, internal taxation, um, because it involved you know troops coming in and um, and you know taking a, like snooping around in your in, on your property and you know trying to assess how much you owe. Whereas with a tariff, you know it. Um, you know, it's paid at at the at the dock, and it's it um, it's less it's, it's seen seen as less intrusive. Um, but again, it's it's really the the, the principle uh, that really upset the the Americans that um, that even though the revenue level was was really low, and um, that that it was the the principle, and and so. That's what, that's what's amazing about how how easy we are in terms of the, the taxation that we're even just this tiny tiny taxation just the principle of it upset people and like Ron Paul said that that once you um, uh, once you t uh, give a one percent you're giving a hundred percent of the principle. Oak. Okay. So how do we get from where we are now with fairly high taxation to that? point where you said that it would be like where the fabric of civilization or something would break. How do you get from here to there when everyone thinks that taxation is okay? Well, I mean, the... So, I mean, all, all political systems depend to some extent on the fact that people consent. 
So, I mean, really all that has to change is that people just have to sort of withdraw their, their consent um, and, and say that, look, we're, we're simply not going to pay these taxes anymore. Now, that's a very th simple thing to say. It's a much more difficult thing to actually do um, because it's, it's not very wise to encourage people not to pay their taxes and nobody wants to risk imprisonment. Um, but the, the real key is, is to just communicate this idea to people that taxes are unjust and that they are destructive to the economy. Uh, and when enough people uh, realize this, really begin to understand this and, and, uh, and put it into practice, then you will see uh, a large, lots and lots of people at the same time withdraw their support for the system. Um, and then, well, I would then, only then we'll be in a situation where there will be some kind of alternative that, that we'll have to propose, like you said. And that's when we can start whittling away at the taxes and, and other regulations and things. So. In American history, one uh, tactic that was used was just civil disobedience. Uh, Murray Rothbard has a great article on the Whiskey Rebellion, which was a, a wide, widespread rebellion against an excise tax on whiskey that was, that was successful. Um, even though George Washington actually um, came in militarily and put a stop to one particular revolt where they were like, um, where they were actually manhandling tax, pay, tax collectors, um, it, it didn't stop there, that, that it was still really hard for the government to, uh, to collect the whiskey tax. And so then ultimately it was, it was abandoned. Um, and, and that was the, the last time that there was a peacetime excise tax in America um, until the Civil War. Yes. Um, you mentioned the Rothbard article on the poll tax. Um, near the end of the article, it said that um, Scotland did not have a force of tax, and the third population just refused to pay it. Um, and then we were talking earlier about uh, serfdom. Um, and so I wonder, there are there seem to be two voluntary taxes, two systems of government under monarchy. So, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, it seems like the only moral governments are no government at all with anarchy and monarchy. Is that, well, um, I mean, I guess those tax systems come out of another, another form of government. But. Well, Hans Hermann Hoppe makes the point that um, there are some that in a monarchy, you know who the state is. Like if Obama, if King Obama tried to say the state is us, he, it wouldn't fly. Um, and so, so there, there's built-in resistance um, because of that. And so, so that's that's one way in which um, in which that's true. But then you have kings like Philip the Fair, um, who who were really you know rapacious um, at the same time. Um, let's see if there's another. Does the Federal Reserve have anything to do with taxation? And if it does, what does it have to do with it? I, there are some connections, but, um, but, but really, um, we tend to think of the Federal Reserve as an, all, uh, as an, alter as an alternative type way of, of influencing um, the economy. Generally speaking, you make a distinction in economics between uh, monetary policy, which is the Federal Reserve, and uh, basically just changes in the money supply, changes in interest rates, things of that nature. And on the other hand, there's fiscal policy, which is the government's budget, taxes, spending, and so on. Um, and those are generally viewed as alternative methods of trying to um, push, uh, trying to influence the economy, push it in one way or another. Um, so, so in that sense, um, the Federal Reserve is, is not connected to, to taxation. Although, of course, um, I think you were pointing out the, uh, the inflation tax. Uh, of course, this, this is one informal way um, that the Fed very much is involved in the business of taxation is, is because it changes the purchasing power of money. Um, it, it, it imposes this implicit tax um, on all people who hold uh, money. So. And at, at the same time, even if there isn't price inflation, I mean, there's no such thing as a free lunch. 
I mean, the, there's a certain amount of goods and services that are out there, and um, and so if if uh, you print a, a bunch of money out of nowhere and give it to a bunch of bankers, and suddenly they have um, they they have the wherewithal to um, command a greater portion of this these goods and services that are out there at at any given moment, then you know when when you're talking about one given moment, it's a zero sum game. So if if they have if they are suddenly richer, then in that given moment, other people are poor. So so any time you you just uh, print money out of nowhere, it is a redistribution. And so even if if there isn't noticeable price inflation, it, it's still a tax. It's still a redistribution of wealth. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you all. Thank you all.